Hey there, this is Seth Schaefer from Team Just Cause Robotics, and today I'll be covering how I modified a very affordable 3D printer into a carbon fiber nylon printing beast without breaking the bank. Combat Robotics often pushes the boundaries of what is possible for a hobbyist in the engineering world. With the recent explosion of the hobby 3D printer market over the last 5-10 to 10 years, it's never been easier to get involved in the amazing world of digital fabrication. Just $200 can buy you a relatively capable, if finicky, 3D printer, something I discussed at length in a prior video you can check out from the card above. FDM 3D printing has a huge number of advantages over traditional machining, but it also has a lot of downsides. While printing PLA on your brand new Ender 3 might be a breeze, if you want to switch to engineering plastics, you'll find you quickly hit a wall. That's because basically every cheap Chinese 3D printer ships with the cheapest possible hot end and extruder. There are a number of issues with these, particularly when it comes to printing carbon fiber or glass fiber nylon. Requirements for those filaments. Brass nozzles will wear quickly with any abrasive filament, not just carbon fiber or glass fiber, but even the additives of glow-in-the-dark filaments, wood filaments, and even some white filaments with titanium dioxide pigment will degrade a nozzle after just a kilo or two. In some cases, even the hobbed gears in the extruder can wear down from abrasive filaments. Plus, nearly all ungeared extruders can't apply enough force to properly feed filament down a long Bowden tube and into the nozzle. The cheap PTFE lined hot ends are a hazard to use above 245 Celsius or so. At this temperature, the PTFE will break down releasing toxic fumes and it will melt and gum up the hot end leading to jams. You'll need an all metal heat break to print with high temperature filaments. Most Bowden style extruders struggle with flexible filaments because they have a poorly constrained filament path on top of the extruder gearing problems I mentioned earlier. Printers equipped with a flat glass or other fixed bed will often have problems with either getting prints to stick or taking them off once they do. Coating the bed is often necessary. Most cheap printers come with a warped bed that isn't flat and no way to compensate for this. The process known as bed leveling is really just tramming. If the bed dips down in the middle, it'll always be too close to the nozzle at the corners or too far in the middle. If you swap to an all metal hot end, the firmware will probably prevent you from going above 260C anyway, and firmware mods are not exactly beginner friendly changes to make. You also need a way to dry out your filament and keep your filament dry while printing if you want to even think about printing with nylon, unless you live in a desert. Personally, I absolutely hate LCD knob interfaces that most cheap printers use. The move to color screens with intuitive menus or even touch screens can't come fast enough. Most have obnoxiously loud, cheap strepper drivers and or fans. Obviously, this is a lot of shortcomings to address. Some higher quality machines with a matching price point address some of these problems, like my Prusa Mark S, for instance. Though it has the same LCD interface, it's laid out far more intuitively with shortcuts to preheat, load, and unload filament. It also comes with an E3D V6 all-metal hot end, flexible magnetic build plate, and auto bed leveling with an inductive probe. It has an extremely well thought out mechanical construction, although heavily reliant on printed parts, and it ships with a brass nozzle, but it's a standard E3D nozzle, so that's super easy to change. However, printing at higher temperatures than 270C proved fatal for the printed extruder assembly, as I found out the hard way, needing to reprint the fan duct with alloy 910 after it melted when I printed with polycarbonate. Just Cause Pro 3D Printer a couple weeks ago, a Makerspace member sent a message to everyone saying he had a TiVo Tarantula Pro with a broken extruder he wanted to get rid of. I'd already been planning this video for over a month at that point, but had a hard time justifying paying $200 to $400 for a printer only to throw away its hot end. And so, I collected the broken printer, and my mission to create the ultimate carbon fiber nylon 3D printer began. Now, obviously I'm not trying to print with peak at 350 Celsius or anything nuts like that. Some people are crazy enough to build a full heated enclosure, water cool those steppers, relocate all the electronics elsewhere, etc, etc. I really just wanted to use as many pure off-the-shelf parts as possible. This would be my first attempt to really modify Marlin firmware at all, so I didn't want to do anything that hasn't been done before, so as to have some hope of finding info from the others who've done so before me. I was massively helped out by the fact that the printer frame I got has an MKS Gen L mainboard. This means it has a lot of expansion ports, detailed pinout, and all open source everything on GitHub. In fact, the 3D printing community has by and large embraced the idea of open source hardware and software designs. There's a massive community of printer owners who have modified their own machines. I'm using the following upgrades, all linked in the video description in a spreadsheet. Tried and true clone E3D V6. Titanium heat break. E3D Hardened Steel Nozzle X Readily Available Blower Fan A 5 volt NPN Normally Open Inductive Bed Leveling Probe Magnetic Spring Steel Flex Plate Garolite LE Sheet Thermal Tapes to the Flex Plate 
and a plug and play MKS TFT 3.5 inch touchscreen. With all of these, I've created what I'm calling the Just Cuz Pro 3D printer. Teething issues. The most daunting upgrade here was really the firmware. I only had to cut and solder wires for the fans, the new thermistor, and the probe. I was also able to simply swap a few pins around in an included connector to plug the probe into the proper header on the mainboard, which is the only time I had to change anything on the mainboard wiring. The touchscreen plugged in and that was that with the original LCD available if I needed it. I simply printed a case for it that I found on Thingiverse, velcroed it to the front of the printer. I was annoyed to discover there was no existing mount for the E3D V6 that matched the X carriage on this machine, but it was pretty straightforward to design my own clamp mount with probe mount integrated. The firmware gave me lots of trouble, however. If I go into detail, none of this will make any sense to someone who hasn't messed with Marlin firmware before. Suffice it to say that my biggest issue now is once the printer runs an auto bed leveling routine, it seems to forget the value I set for the offset between the probe height and the nozzle height, meaning it will print several millimeters above the bed instead of squishing the first layer down within 0.2 millimeters of the bed. I also couldn't manage to get Marlin 2.0 on the printer because I think the main board might have run out of space or something. I'm not entirely certain, but either way, still using Marlin 1. something firmware that the printer came with and just modifying it heavily to work with the probe and everything else has been working perfectly fine thus far. End result. While I still need to do some tuning and perfect the touchscreen interface a bit, so far my results have been very promising. I've already managed to print out several carbon fiber nylon gearbox housings, which was basically what finally drove me to pursue this project in the first place. I've set up my dry box with a long Bowden tube leading to this printer on the floor, but I'll probably end up expanding my printer stand or adding onto it. I initially set up the printer with just the E3D V6, probe, and flex plate, but over the next week added the rest of the upgrades. I printed successfully on just the PEI coated steel sheet, but it wasn't super reliable so I finally stuck the Garolite on with some thermal tape on Friday, and that's worked great so far. The extruder sometimes skips a little, but despite this, the prints have all come out with an incredibly attractive surface finish on the sidewalls, and aside from some issues with oozing filament screwing up the first layers, I haven't had any bed adhesion problems on the Garolite yet. My initial test prints with bright red PLA were surprisingly good, even though I had heard many people have issues with the added friction of a steel nozzle over the stock brass ones. I think the coating that the Nozzle X has helps with that aspect. Plus, steel has a much worse thermal conductivity than brass, and all of the carbon fiber nylon filaments say to print below 60 millimeters a second, so I'll never be printing super fast with this machine to begin with. I'll still probably do most of my non-nylon printing with the Prusa because it's so reliable, but I might try other difficult to print materials on the Just Cause Pro printer, such as glass fiber nylon and other abrasive filaments. Seeing how brittle polycarbonate was and the massive improvement that the carbon fiber nylon made with the gearboxes, I doubt I'll ever use polycarbonate again. I was a bit worried that there might be warping issues like I had on the Prusa with Alloy 910 nylon, but the Garolite bed locks the prints down really well, and carbon fiber actually has a lot lower thermal expansion rate than base nylon material, so both glass fiber and carbon fiber nylon supposedly warp a lot less than plain nylon does. I should also mention, since I'm cheap, I'm using Sane Smart's carbon fiber nylon, which is about $66 a kilogram, essentially the same price as Alloy 910 but it's 25% carbon fiber by weight. Matterhacker's Nylon X is only 20% carbon fiber by weight, but it costs $116 a kilogram. And Sane Smart also sells a glass-filled nylon filament for about the same price, though it's out of stock at the moment. I'll be sure to try that out eventually. Next week's video should be a continuation of the brushless gearbox project from last week if all goes to plan, so stay tuned. I'll be updating you all on my progress on Instagram throughout the week. Speaking of which, several people on Facebook seemed to think I was being too hard on Cosmo's design, but I really meant no harm. We have two completely different design goals. Mine is designed specifically for my robot and to be as lightweight as possible. His is designed to be much more durable, reliable, and capable of being produced in larger quantities. Plus, he's selling his gearboxes to other builders, and I'm not going to be selling completed gearboxes to anyone. He said he's designed his gearbox with an offset motor position so that he has a more solid wall of material behind the output shaft to better support axial loads. I think that's a more durable design than what I've come up with, but that's a trade-off that I chose to make with my design. As always, if you liked this video, leave a like, comment if you have any questions, and subscribe if you want to see more content like this. Thanks for watching!